Hi, good evening, everybody. No. No, you're live. I like that. Can you hear me? Yeah, good, good. All right, well, I am very, very thrilled to be here in Grand Rapids. This is my second time in Grand Rapids. I was here about five years ago um, to give another artist talk. Was anybody at that talk? Oh, good, I'm safe. I can make the same jokes. Um, that wasn't one of them. Um, so my, my complete gratitude to so many people here, I think I could spend the next hour just thanking people. So I've written down a list of some people, and my apologies to those of you who I'm forgetting. So of course, the, the Voss family for finding a way to engage a broader section of our community in the arts. Um, and thanks to my twin sister in the art jury grand prize, Daniela, for her fine work. Um, to Sarah Joseph and Michelle Busak, of course, and Kevin Buist and all the behind-the-scenes people that, um, that made the art prize happen and my show happen here. And just for you to understand, so Michelle called me and asked me to be part of the show she was putting together, and I said, yeah, sure, of course. And then she gave me like the prime real estate for the show. So really grateful. <laughs> um, and also a thank you to the late, great Susan Solins, um, Leonardo Drew, Katerina Gross, and Andrew Resseth. Um, and then, of course, I'm grateful to each one of you in the audience for coming out tonight. Otherwise, I would be talking to myself, and that would be no fun. So that long-winded gratitude list is just evidence of how many, many people it takes to make artwork work. So I want to share with you just some thoughts that I have about how artwork has worked in my life. Um, the way that I think through the work that I make, and also the sources that feed the work. So to begin, I'm going to show you about 50 slides. I'm going to try and show them to you quickly. I'm going to try and talk really quickly, but I also hope that if you have questions that you'll interrupt me and, and ask me questions, because for the most part, I'm a little tired. For the most part, I know what I'm going to say, though so sometimes I surprise myself. But it's your questions that I'm kind of living for. It's that part of the dialogue that I get to take home that feeds my studio practice. Um, there are several points in this lecture that I could point to you that a question from the audience led to a piece. So you are implicit in whatever is about to happen next. Um, and I'm going to end up with the Haircraft Project. So we're, wait for it. It's coming at the end. OK? Wait for it. I want to start off by sharing with you a quote that has um, inspired my art practice, or in one sense it explains the way that I think about my art practice, and it's from the um, great author Toni Morrison. She was writing about what it meant for her to be a writer and the way that she thinks about writing, and she said, they straightened out the Mississippi River in places to make room for houses and livable acreage. Occasionally the river floods these places. Now, floods is the word they use, but in fact, the river's not flooding. The river's remembering. The river's remembering where it once used to be. All water has a perfect memory and is forever trying to get back to where it once was. And then she goes on to say that writers are like that. Like water, I remember where I was before I was straightened out. I'd like to think that as an artist, I'm like that as well. And a more succinct version of that is a Yoruba proverb I should mention that my father was Yoruba um, via Trinidad. Um, the proverb is, a river that forgets its source dries up. So I want to share with you some sources, and I want to share with you some ideas of work working. So I've been thinking about how artwork forms and engages and defines community. And I've been uh, teaching and rereading Pablo Elguera's uh, framing this idea of thinking about social engagement and art practice, um, specifically the framing of creative participation and collaborative participation. And so I wanted to share with you um, some things that informed my career very early on. I decided a long time ago that I wanted to use textiles in my artwork. And I decided to use textiles because here's a medium in which we all understand it. All of you are wearing clothes. All of you are being touched by your clothing in the very, very sensitive private areas. So you know clothing intimately, right? So it's a shared language to begin with. But I also like to think of cloth as having a kind of DNA. Um, 
And I'll pursue that a little bit further. I, in one sense, it structures who we are like DNA does. It lets us know who the other person is that we're dealing with. It can mask our identity or it can reveal our identity. But in one sense, the shirt that you're wearing now knows you and you know it. But moreover, because we've been made as human beings, we've been designing cloth for a really long time, and we've been des designing it across our ancestry and across our heritage, it's a kind of a collaborative medium. The way that we weave cloth now is really not so different than the way that it was woven hundreds and thousands of years ago. And so in that sense, the hand that's on the loom now is connected to the hand that was on the loom thousands of years ago. So there's a way that cloth becomes a method in which we can talk across time to one another. So two examples of that. One is um, on the image on the, um, on the left, which is in Ugungun from, Europe, from the Yoruba people of Nigeria. And I just revealed to you that my father is Yoruba, um, again, through Trinidad. He grew up in Trinidad, but his heritage was Yoruba. And the Yoruba people have this living quilt tradition, the Agungun. It's the Agungun comes out as a dance masquerade to celebrate the unnamed ancestors. And this masquerade figure is not just the, the figure that you're seeing in the center on the left. It's not just the costume. It's also the dance. It's the music. It's the audience. It's the food that's prepared. It's all of that is the agungun. It's not just the single cloth, but the cloth in one sense absorbs all of that. And the agungun is made out of these strips of very highly elaborately um, decorated and woven and beaded cloth. And then the dancer dances in a way that makes those cloths swing out in this sort of centripetal force. And the sense is that as that cloth whiffs by your ear, it's as if the ancestor, ancestors are speaking to you. Now that kind of thing just still gives me chills. This is not the first time I've talked about this, but it still gives me chills. That kind of using cloth as our DNA, as a way of thinking about who we are collectively. And then Pitchy Patchy on the right-hand side of the slide um, is from Jamaica. So clearly some Yoruba people through M Middle Passage came across um, to the Caribbean to where my mother is from. Now here's the poor man's version, right? because these are now enslaved Africans, so they're not making beautifully elaborate strips of cloth, but they still are holding on to this retention of strips of cloth. It's as if each strip of that cloth becomes a person in your family tree. And so Pitchy Patchy and Agungun become like livable quilts. They become like our DNA. A friend of mine's um, father is an artist who, have, who I've respected for many years, the artist Sam Gilliam. And I was in conversation with him once, and he said sort of just offhandedly, others look to a monument, we look to a piece of cloth. And so that idea of monumentality, I take that to mean something that is enduring, memorable, something that's really an enduring, memorable example. Um, So is there any, are there any Jamaicans in the house? That is shocking. Jamaicans are everywhere. I'm the only Jamaican in the house. Is that possible? Some of you are Jamaican and you don't know. I'm just going to go with that. Um, no, I'm serious. Jamaicans are everywhere. Um, I ask you that because the motto of Jamaica, where my mother is from, is um, out of many one people. And I share that with you because um, my mother's side of the family. My mother's maiden name is McCarty, and it's not a slave name. Um, people in our family, of course, were enslaved, but um, McCarty is not a slave name. It's a family name. And like many Jamaicans who have European blood in them, it's probably Scottish blood. So my great-grandfather, um, Alexander McCarty, came to Jamaica. And this is his family, or our family, Tartan. Now, don't judge me. Um, can you guys even see that plaid? Can you see it? It's not such a lovely plaid. I was not there 500 years ago when they designed this, so don't blame it on me. 
But my point is that I'm coming from both sides of my family where cloth is important. Certainly on the Scottish side, the European less evident side of my family. I don't walk around saying I'm Scottish to everybody or expect people to think that I'm Scottish. Um, but the, the tartan, that sense of the clan attached to a plaid and your cloth is something that comes from the European side and then the agungun and pitchy-patchy and all of that coming from the African side, as best I know it. Well, let me also share with you this notion of a sort of collective experience that's very much like the Agungun that happens in the highlands of Scotland, where my great-grandfather was from. The highlands of Scotland, they have these wells called Clutie wells. Clutie is a uh, uh, Scottish word for like rag. So a rag well occurs where there's a naturally occurring spring. And people would take pilgrimages to these naturally occurring springs. And they, of course, would be wearing their family tartans. And they would take these pilgrimages to get healed, either because they had a broken heart or something else. It could be a physical ailment or a spiritual or psychological ailment. And they would rip a piece of their hand-woven tartan, dip it in the naturally occurring well, wash that afflicted part of their body, let's say it's the broken heart, and then tie a piece of that cloth to the nearest tree. So the Clutie well that you're seeing here is actually a very powerful one, right? Because there's evidence of all the pilgrimages that people have taken to it. No one wants to use a Clutie well that has one little tied piece of cloth on it. You go to the one that has evidence of this accumulation, evidence of people embodied, this sense of this Clutie well now has the DNA of all those people there, right, in a sense. So cloth is DNA. So I wanted to share with you this, this, again, this idea of the collective and one, um, a couple of projects that I've done in the past. It's not just a haircraft project that I've engaged um, several people to help in the making and creation and collaboration of work. But in the past, I did this piece, which is called the Beaded Prayers Project. Now, the Beaded Prayers Project is a simple arithmetic. I took the Names Aid Memorial Quilt Project, which I'm hoping that many of you are familiar with. Some of you are nodding your heads. Um, this happens to be an image of my hometown in Washington, D.C., which I consider our sort of national um, ancestral ground, if you will, right? Um, so the, the, for those of you who don't know about the Names AIDS Memorial Quilt Project, it was a project in which people were um, memorializing people who had died of AIDS by making quilts that were about bed size, twin size beds. So at the height of the AIDS ep epidemic um, in the 90s, when people really started realizing there was a huge problem. You could write that 10,000 people had died of AIDS, and that might take up an inch of paper. But when you embody it in 10,000 people as quilts on the mall in Washington, DC, then it's more impactful. To give you a sense of scale in the bottom um, right corner, those are people there, about 20 of them. So it really took a lot of space. So thinking about that, how cloth could have impact in multiples, that was one part of the project. The second part of the project were these amulets that I had done, had researched from West Africa. Um, and so the gentleman in the center is from Ghana, and he's wearing an amulet-covered shirt that are often called hunter's or warrior's cloth shirts. The amulets are either stuffed with um, writings from the Quran or prayers or medicinal medicine, I mean medicinal stuffs. And they're passed down from generation to generation to generation. And one of the ways that this has been explained to me is that they were sort of like little poultices if you were going to go on a hunt or a battle. Um, and if you got hurt or scarred or wounded, then you could open one of these poultices and it would you know, prevent the bleeding from getting too bad. But imagine if you went on a great hunt and the amulet that you had on you you didn't even get wounded. And that's really strong medicine, right? And so this accumulation of them, is, it's, it's an heirloom. It's been passed down from generation to generation to generation. And so you can see that it, too, is a powerful shirt because of how many of these amulets are on it. And then finally, um, the image on the far right is of someone holding a rosary. And I named the project the Beaded Prayers Project, not because I'm a religious person, because I'm in fact not. I'm a bit of a heathen, actually. Um, but I am interested in the history of words. And so the word bead comes from, oh, what happened? 
I need to do an update, not now, maybe later. <laughs> um, the history of the, the word history, the etymology of the word bead, um, shares that with prayer because of rosary beads. So in Old English, the word bidan, which we get the word bid and bet from, is the same word that we have for bead. And so then I formed the Beaded Prayers Project. And I asked people from all over the world. I started this in this project in 1998. And I asked people from all over the world to write down an aspiration, a hope, a dream, a wish, a prayer, um, to make two, one for them to keep, and one to contribute to the larger project. Let's go the right direction. 5,000, over 5,000 people contributed from 35 different nations. The project is still ongoing, um, and it, it got shown in about 30 different venues. Again, this idea of the power of accumulation, the power of cloth as monument, and the sense of representing all those people in a room. We couldn't fit 5,000 people in this room, but we could fit the presence of 5,000 people in this room. So cloth is a sort of schenectady, a way of standing in for the human body. Now, I also think that cloth has the ability to speak. There's a way in which that Beaded Prayers Project, even though you have no idea that it's what's sealed in those packets that are beaded, um, that you could feel the presence of all those aspirations. I know that might sound a little mystical and funny, but honestly, it is something that happens in the space for many people. I started thinking about other ways in which I had witnessed cloth speaking, cloth's ability to speak. And again, to go to the etymology, the word text and textile, it, they are first cousins from the Latin word texere, which means to weave. So when I first went to West Africa, I wanted to study this West African cloth. I wanted to study kente cloth, because kente cloth was being used in the 90s as a symbol to all African American people that this product you should buy because here's some kente cloth we put it on our ad <laughs> and it was sort of fascinating to me that they were using a cloth that had this very deep history already that in fact does speak so kente cloth um, this particular one that i'm sharing with you on the bottom right hand side of the screen um, is this one is called adwinayasa which means my skill is exhausted that's the name of this cloth, because it's woven on a loom like you see me weaving just above it. Um, very simple, but yet complex, you know, it is from looms that computers evolved. And I can tell you more about that later, but it is from the loom that computers evolved. Um, so in very, very simple looms that we've been designing with, um, with our ancestors, these kinds of complex cloths can be made. Now, the cloth as a whole is called Adabunayasa, that my skill is exhausted, but in each part and parcel of the cloth, there are proverbs that are woven into it. So I went to the Smithsonian in the 90s when I was in graduate school at Cranbrook, and I studied the symbology in kente cloth, and I used that together with a cloth that we're all familiar with, the American flag, to deal with the fact that we've even changed the way that people like me and heritages like mine have been named. So in my lifetime, Negro, um, Afro-American, African-American, Black, all of those, right? all these name changes. But at some point, African-American was in there as a sort of way of trying to balance two kinds of identity um, and perhaps qualifying an American identity with its Africanness. So I took the American flag and symbols from the Kente flag and wove them together and then asked 50 women um, who are African-American in, um, in Detroit to tie their heads in this cloth. Um, and while their heads were tied, to share with me, to have a dialogue with me about the symbology as they understood it from kente cloth and also what the American flag meant to them. And I like to think that that conversation was absorbed into this cloth. Now, I'm only going to tell you about one of the symbols, and it's the one that looks like steps, that sort of yellow and red one, and the bottom right of that um, top portion. And that is called adwa, and it refers, it means steps, and it refers to self-advancement. So hold on to that thought, because we'll refer to it again a little later. There'll be a quiz coming. So not only thinking about cloth in terms of its accumulation, in terms of the way that we are designing with our ancestors across time, in terms of the way that it speaks of who we are collectively and individually, 
um, in the way that cloth is actually has the ability to speak and hold proverbs, but also to think about the materiality of cloth. Does anyone know what this might be a field of? No? Anyone want to take a guess? You don't even want to take a guess? What, what did someone say? Sorghum. That's a good guess. See, that wasn't so hard. I'm not so scary. All right. It's actually sugar cane, right? So you know that both of my parents are from the Caribbean. So, and sugar was the drug of trade. That's why they ended up, um, the Africans in my family ended up there. So I wanted to make a piece that was using the, you know, once you squeeze out of the sugar out of sugar cane, the sugar juice out of sugar cane, you're left with bagasse, which is just the fiber that's left. And that can, fiber can be made into a cloth. And so the cloth that I decided to make that into is a woven um, tartan, McCarty tartan, because of course my great grandfather came to Jamaica to have a sugar cane plantation, right? So both of those heritages coming together through the cloth. But it doesn't make any sense unless you happen to know that it's made out of Bagasi, and Bagasi happens to be sugarcane. And then I have lived in Richmond, Virginia for 10 years now. And it's grown on me. I didn't think it would stick living in the seat of the Confederacy, but it's grown on me. And there are people in the. Um, in that state, like the former governor, Bob McDonald, who has gotten himself in a fair amount of trouble these days um, for some misappropriation of funds, who in April of 2010 declared, um, I'm sorry, in the year 2010 decided to declare April Confederate History Month. And here's the thing about that. <laughs> Honestly, I don't have a problem with it, because I think we need to remember our history. I think as soon as we forget our history, that's when we get in trouble. I had a problem with the fact that he wasn't mentioning anything about the contributions that African Americans had made to the wealth of this nation, um, or any contributions that we'd made. I mean, Richmond is built by African American hands, all the buildings, you know, all the wealth in that nation, I mean, in this nation. It's, it's built on the backs of a lot of African American people. So I decided to insert the American flag through hairdressing techniques, our current American flag. At its roots is the Confederate battle flag. But to get to the American flag, African Americans were involved. So this is the thing. At some point, I started asking a very simple question. Simple questions often drive my work. And one of the quest simple questions I ask is, textiles are really old, really, really old. And if we define textiles as the manipulation of a fiber towards an aesthetic or functional purpose, what might have been the very first textile? And I landed at hairdressing. The fiber we all grow, we cut it, we groom ourselves, the first time we manipulated a fiber towards an aesthetic or functional purpose. So I'm going to show you this image a couple times during this talk. Um, and I want to share with you that one of the ways, of course, of looking at images is to think about what Roland Barthes talks about, this way of looking at images through two different lenses. One is called studium. And that's what we would sort of all agree that we're looking at here. So what do you see? You also can't get this one wrong. What do you see? Oh, sighted people looking towards the screen. <laughs> A girl getting her hair done, right? That sounds about right to everybody. I mean, we've added some gender. We're not really sure. It might not be a girl, so there's some assumptions there. But yeah, someone is getting their hair done. Sometimes people say someone is doing someone's hair. So it depends on which body you're putting yourself in. Are you an observer? Or are you putting yourselves in you know, the hands of the maker? You know, but in any case, we'd all agree. So studium is the kind of way, the lens that collectively we would look at something and agree that that's what we're seeing. I'm simplifying, but just bear with me. Punctum 
as Roland Barthes came up with, is the really sort of much more personal way that one would read this. And when I look at this, I agree with you, like it's an image of someone getting their hair done. But it also reminds me of when I was cute and young and getting my hair done. And I remember the tug of getting my hair done. And I remember sitting in between the knees of the cooler, like teenage girls who were doing my hair and like loving the hairstyles that had like really personal stuff. I remember the food I was eating, you know. So I look at that image and it conjures all this other stuff that's really personal, right? That I wouldn't expect anyone else to understand because it's my personal stuff. So there's a punctum reading, like from the very personal space. And then there's a more collective reading, the studium reading. And so that punctum reading led to a body of work that in part was inspired by, um, by this guy. J.D. Ojikeri is a Nigerian photographer who died last year. They dedicated the Haircraft Project to his legacy. He was taking photographs of West African women. These are all his photographs. I mean, not all of them, but these are <laughs> photographs only by J.D. Ojikeri. He was taking photographs of West African women's phenomenal hairstyles around the same time that I was an eight-year-old kid getting my hair done in DC by the hands of the ambassador's daughter from Benin. So we grew, I grew up in DC. There's this big mansion across the street from where my, my parents, you know, really humble, not so fabulous rancher. The big, be beautiful stone mansion across the street from us. And they had 12 children. And the ambassador's kids' older daughters would do our hair and send us home. And we had fabulous hairdos. And I still have not forgiven my mother for not taking photographs of every last one of them. All I have is that one little one where it's sort of falling out on the side, right? That's all I have, and the memory of it, right? So I wanted to preserve that memory somehow. And I started making, oops, sorry, I started making the wig series. So you can see how this is leading to the Haircraft Project. These are three-dimensional versions of what um, happens downstairs. Now this is the thing. There's a way that we can think of hairdressing as vanity. Um, and there's a way of thinking of it as ritual. So the Yoruba people in Nigeria the soul is not in the heart or the knee or your butt or somewhere else. The soul is in your head. The seat of your soul is in your head. So what you do with your hair is ritual activity. It's celebrating your soul. It's not just vanity. And there's some retention of that in African American culture. Now, everything that I've shared with you so far is about to be summed up very annoyingly by this friend of mine who was a poet. I kind of hate poets. <laughs> I love this guy, though. OK. So my friend Kim Stafford, who I show you a picture of here, because I used to just read the poem, and everybody would think he was a sister from Atlanta. <laughs> not a sister. He's not even from Atlanta. Um, you go out, you see cornrows, interlocks, microweave. And on the street, the women and the men are fully dressed in goddess braids, flat twist, Senegalese. The mind made festive by pixie dreads. Sun seeks the neat detail. Rain glistens on the perfect weave, crochet, tropical twist, invisible. You without style, where did you lose the power to discover the beautiful work of the human hand intelligent in the finer things? OK, let me explain to you how annoying Chris Stafford, Kim Stafford is. So first of all, he has some knowledge about some hairdressing techniques, like deep knowledge, you know. Um, secondly, he has a little craft theory in there as well. And he also does the hair textile thing all on one page. And he has pretty good hair, too. You can tell that, because it's sort of like this dude's. So this idea that hair indicates, this is a photograph by a friend of mine, Bill Gaskins. Um, the photograph is entitled Jelani. I'm going to share with you that I think all the fabulous hairstyles that I had done on my hair downstairs, I still think the best hairstyle is an afro. It's just a wonderful thing. For those of you who do not grow gravity-defying hair, 
I wish for you to go to your local science museum, grab one of those electric balls, and feel what I feel when I am sporting my afro. You feel connected to the universe. I'm not joking. Like the wind blows, and you're like, yes, yes, I hear you, wind. <laughs> It's a special thing. I've had my hair straightened. I know what it's like to have this. I know what that feels like. You know, I get that. I just want all of you to have some of this. Now, what's funny is I have some Scottish cousins without any African blood in them, and they have that really curly red hair that's an afro. And they, they know, they know, they know. Anyway, I think that um, hair indicates a lot of things, and of course the afro indicates a lot of things about... Um, Power, black, the black power movement, um, identity. Um, but it's also a nimbus, it's also a crown, you know? And so I thought that some people should get that crown. I mean, honestly, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for this dude, right? You know? I mean, we wouldn't be here together, right, if it weren't for this guy. Um, so a question from the audience came once, and they said, well, of all the images of Abraham Lincoln, why did you pick a $5 bill? Why a $5 bill? Because you could have picked anything. And in one sense, I picked a $5 bill because that's the most common image of him. That's the one everybody knows, and it was easy for me to find. Also, each one of these is unique, right? I made 44 of them for our 44th president. Um, and um, each one of them is unique because each $5 bill is unique. It has its own serial number, right? The person's question persisted because I started thinking, you know, Abraham Lincoln's decision was not an easy decision. It was an economic decision. It's nice to say he was an abolitionist and all of that, but it was an economic decision. He was trying to hold a nation together, right? So what have I done as an artist, right? I put an afro on him, and by the way, these are worth more than $5. It's a very valuable afro. By inserting the African-American presence on Abraham Lincoln, who allows me to even be here before you guys, um, I put him into the art market. I put him into the market, right? And it was that person's question that made me really think, like, why did I use a $5 bill? Why did I put him on money? Anyway, this idea of using hair is not new. All over the world, people have been using hair as a medium. Even in the show downstairs, there's fabulous art that is using hair as a medium. Um, this is turning to my uh, Scottish side again, these Victorian hair wreaths um, from Queen Victoria, right, Scottish lady. Um, and, um, and then this tradition of using European hair to make these beautiful floral hair wreaths that you start, started seeing in the, the Americas as well. It's a beautiful, beautiful tradition. This one is, happens to be from the 1880s. So I decided that I needed to make an African-American version of that, um, but it's really a biracial version. This is, um, I have a friend whose mother is, actually she's from Detroit, a lot of Michigan people. Um, her, her mother is European, her father is African heritage, and um, she grows dreadlocks like a sheep. And I really love that. And she also didn't grow up with this thing that I grew up with. My mom would not let us, when she would cut our hair, she would burn it because she would say that, you know, you don't want your hair to end up in the wrong place. And I used to think this is like some weird hocus pocus that my mom grew up with. But, you know, then I, you start watching like CSI and you're like, <laughs> you don't want your DNA landing up in the wrong place. Anyway, my friend didn't grow up with those kinds of notions, so she just grows her dreadlocks and cut them for me. So she's responsible for my early works that were made out of hair because I didn't want to make works out of my own hair. The way that I was raised, I thought, I certainly can't do that. Um, but then I got over it. So this one is actually made out of um, little hairballs of my own hair. Um, and I found this great box called Heritage Culture Pearls. Um, perfect place to put it in. So the idea of cloth as being DNA now has morphed into actual DNA, right? You know, hair as being DNA. <clears throat> the thing about these pieces is that they actually do go into the art market, and so there is this thing about putting Abraham Lincoln into the art market, you know, um, putting the great emancipator up for sale, um, but also putting my own body up for sale, putting my own DNA and my own ancestry up for sale, too. 
um, and how that is problematized and raises questions as well. Let's go to a little bit of art history. This, I think, is maybe one of the most postmodern textile forms, even though this piece is from the 17th century. It happens to be at the Victoria Albert Museum in London. Um, and it's, uh, it's a tapestry, a quite large tapestry of the three fates. But it's a tapestry, so it's a textile, talking about a textile metaphor. I love that, the re reflexivity in it. So the three fates are um, Clotho and um, Lachesis and Atropos. And Clotho is a person who spins the thread of life. Lachesis is the one who allots the length of your life. And Atropos is the one who does the final snip, right? So it's a metaphor of thread, the thread of life. And it made me start thinking about how one could use textiles, or specifically hair, to measure life. And I, start, I met these two people when I was in the Smithsonian the second time to do some research on a Smithsonian Artist Research Fellowship. So the gentleman on the left, I didn't meet him in person. Um, his name is Hans Longseth, and he has the longest beard, still, on record. And his beard is in the Smithsonian, so I met his beard. <laughs> and then the person on the right is a woman who had been growing her hair for 15 years since the Million Man March. And she was standing in the same spot that she was standing in in the Million Man March. Um, and her dread she had short hair and then dreadlocks. Hans Longseth, his beard in the Smithsonian has now become a site of ancestor worship. The physical anthropologist who's responsible for taking care of Hans Longseth's 18 some foot, 18 and a half foot beard, um, started keeping a family tree because everybody, there were lots of people who knew that they had a relative whose longest beard was at the Smithsonian. And so he started keeping a record of who, how were you related to Hans Longseth? And so he started keeping a family tree for people and was actually introducing people from the family to other members of their family because they were all coming to visit their DNA, right? So I made some art on that. <clears throat> I tried to figure out how long hair would grow, I mean, how long hair would be or how long a dreadlock would be, all the hair that you've grown plus all the hair that you've felted to the other hair that you've grown. Um, so dead hair felt it to new growth hair. How long that would be if you live for 90 years? Anyone want to take a guess of how long a dreadlock would be, like birth to 90 years? You guys are really, you know, if you were my students and I knew your names. 30 feet? Did you just say 30 feet? You get an A+. Plus. It's exactly 30 feet. <laughs> so here's the thing, my dear, dear father, um, well, I was showing this piece in some museum, uh, the Walters Museum in Baltimore, and this is not going to do it any credit, but I'm going to brag for a moment. This print is such a good print that it's hard to imagine that it's not three-dimensional. And I said this in an artist talk, I said it's such a good print that you're going to be nose close to it and you're still, your eye is still going to be like, that looks like it's three-dimensional. And I said, but don't you guys go up there and touch it, because they're museum guards. Don't you know we left the artist talk, we went up to the show, and there is my dear father touching the print. <laughs> it really is a print. I said, Dad? <laughs> he said, what are they going to do? I'm your dad. It's true. It's true. Um, so then I started thinking about using hair as a measurement. So you guys know what these are, right? They're abacuses. Is there anybody in the audience who can read an abacus? Anybody? No? OK. Well, abacuses are used to, um, like calculators, right? They're used to count. Um, in this case, I wanted to make an abacus that was used to count, but it was also a clock as well. So it was measuring time. The abacus on the left reads 1863. The abacus on the right reads 2015. So I made a stop motion video of abacuses me measuring from the year of the Emancipation Proclamation until the present. So every year I have to remake this stop motion video. 
And just in the interest of time, I won't show it to you here, but trust me, it exists. And then to turn to writers again, Maya Angelou um, wrote this lovely little piece, and it made me, it prompted me to make another piece. Um, My hair, a hive of honeybees, is a queenly glory, crackles like castanets, hums like marimbas. Here I got in trouble with my husband. I have been, I've known this guy, I went to college with this guy, I thought he was a weird, weird guy, weird looking guy, weird acting, quiet. Um, now I think he's handsome, he's still quiet. I do all the talking in the family. Um, he's a musician and has been a musician the entire time that I've known him. He's been a musician and he's been a musician the entire time that I've known him. I've known him for 28 years and it took Maya Angelou in this quote for me to put hair and music together. He's a little pissed about that. Your studio's right there, my studio's right here. You never thought hair and music could go together. So anyway, so I decided to put them together in some pretty obvious ways. I thought about bows, right? Because bows have um, horse hair on them. And I even fell into the incorrect language of getting someone to restring a bow, but it's actually not called restringing, it's called rehairing a bow, for those of you who play instruments and are smarter than I am. It took me a really long time to find a bow maker or bow rehairer who was willing to work with human hair. So the one that is, looks blonde and straight is not horse hair, and it's actually not from someone whose hair is blonde. It's um, an Asian woman's hair from the Philippines that's been dyed blonde. That's what you find in the industry, Venezuelan hair, South Africa, I mean South American hair and Asian hair. And then the one on the right is made of a dreadlock of my own hair. And then I asked my friend, who my husband had toured with for many years, another Detroiter, um, the wonderful Regina Carter, jazz violinist, MacArthur winning, sweetest woman on the planet, um, to play two songs that have to do with identity. And again, I sort of picked obvious songs here. I went for the Star Spangled Banner and Lift Every Voice and Sing. So that is to say our national anthem and the Negro national anthem. And they both sound haunting. And I like to think it's a way of hearing our ancestors in the same way that the agungun is that way of hearing, you know, the, that wisping of the agungun, that very first slide that I showed you, by your ears hearing the ancestors, sounding the ancestors. So back to this image. So we've talked a little bit about hairstyling. We've talked a little bit about using hair as a medium. You can't get from one side of that person's hairstyle to the other side of the person's hairstyle without the missing tool. Now here's the thing about these kinds of combs. They're certainly not intended for my hair, right? Uh, they make really good parts, though. They're really good for parting. But they're really not good for combing through really, really curly hair. So I think this comb is, as a material culture object, tells us a lot about who we are. This is a pocket comb, so that notion that you have to always have your hair combed, right? Like you have to have a pocket close. I think they're also a little gendered in a way. Like I think this, they might be more masculine than feminine. And they're certainly intended for people with straight or straightened hair, right? So there's a lot about this object. Also, it's plastic, so you know that this is a culture that is, has a lot of products based in petroleum-based things, right? A lot of, there are dinosaurs in this piece. There are lot, there's lots in this, um, in this object. And I started thinking about the history of that object as it relates to my own history. So there's a Yoruba um, saying, and then you actually find it throughout a lot and throughout West Africa, that people will say that you don't know who you are. Like, you don't know who you are. You might know your name, you might know when you were born, you might feel like, oh, this is my personality, but you, they'll say you don't know who you are unless you can name 10 generations back. And in other words, if you can't account from some DNA 10 generations back, you actually don't know who you are. You don't really know where you come from. You don't know who you are. It's a fascinating sort of way of thinking about identity as not individuality, but the complexity of all the people who have come before us. 
This is what 10 generations looks like. So that single column is me, and then there's the two. Those are my parents, and then you move to my grandparents. So it's an iteration. It's 1,025 combs. You go back 10 generations, 1,025 combs. So you may never, ever, ever feel lonely again. Because 1,025 people got busy for you to be here. I mean, not all together all at once. <laughs> Not one mass orgy, but, you know, in two by twos, you know? And I did this piece in, um, in a comb that I think of as being for European or straight hair, because it's really only through my um, Scottish side that I can trace, trace actually 12 generations. And then I wanted to take the comb home, so I took it to the barber shop. And then I wanted to take the comb and turn it into my own hair, so <laughs> um, using a sort of, uh, I'm simplifying all of these philosophers, so just forgive me for the philosophers out there in the crowd, but to take the idea of Hegel's notion of thesis and antithesis. So if a comb is intended to organize hair and straighten things out and not for curly hair, and you turn it into its antithesis, and you end up with a synthesis. So this is the synthesis of the comb. Around this time, all of my textile people wanted to kick me out of the club. They said, you are working with combs now. You are no longer a textile person. We have removed you from the club. I didn't like that at all. So I decided to make a piece that would put me back in the club. So I started turning combs into textiles. Now this last piece starts making reference back to the kente cloth that you saw, and I frankly got tired of black combs. I like black people. I like white people too. But I, I needed some color. I needed some people of color. <laughs> some people in the, some, I just needed some color in there. So I started thread wrapping the combs um, to give them color. And then when I started thread wrapping the combs to give them color, it made me think about how I learned color theory. This guy, Joseph Albers, who was a brilliant man, um, problematic in some ways, but in terms of uh, teaching color, was a brilliant man. He taught about the relativity of color, that there is no absolute color, that color always exists within context. So this is the this is the cover of the first edition of his book, Interaction of Color. And those two little brown squares, and I'm sorry, it doesn't look so great up here, but it's, it's still working. The two little brown squares are in fact the same color, but because of the context of what's around them, they look a little different. One looks lighter, one looks darker. And I realized I had exactly this experience the first time I went to West Africa. The first time I went to Ghana, not the first time I went to West Africa, but the first time I went to Ghana in particular. When I went to Ghana, people called me a Bruni. A Bruni is the name for white person. And it's not that the Ghanaian people who were calling me a Bruni didn't know that obviously I have African heritage in me. They just draw the color line in a different place than we do as Americans. Americans, we have like 132nd rules. You know, like you have a drop of African blood in you, a little curl in your hair, black, come to the black club. <laughs> and there it's the reverse. You have a little bit of white blood in you, evidently, and then you belong to the Abruni club, right? So this was funny because I'm the same person, right? But in one context, because I'm lighter than skinned, slightly lighter skinned than your average Ghanaian person. I get classified as a white person there, whereas I identify as a black person right here in this context. Same color, different context. Well, my studio assistant said, that's too much story, just do it straight. So there's that one. Um, 
and then to visit this one again, the hands of the hairdresser. I realized I had to acknowledge the hairdressers. So here's my acknowledgement of perhaps the most famous hairdresser, not one who does portraiture normally, but this is a portrait of Madame C.J. Walker. Does anybody know who she is? Yes, over here, hands went up. They're with me, not you, because you answered questions. Yes, will you tell, tell us who she is? Yes, she uh, was the first uh, African-American millionaire. Mm -hmm. She became a millionaire uh, by producing uh, hair care products for African-Americans. That's right, almost right, almost right. She was the first self-made women millionaire. You always hear African-American women millionaire because people want you to know that she's a black lady, right? She was one of the first self-made women millionaires. In other words, she did not inherit her money. Now, she was born in 1868, so black people were barely human then in this country. And certainly women couldn't even vote. By 1919, she in fact did become a millionaire through the hair care business. So I thought she's large and in charge. She's sometimes problematized because some of the things that people like to say about Miss C.J. Walker is that um, she popularized hair straightening. Um, I actually don't have an issue with that. Like I actually don't really have an issue with people straightening their hair, by the way. Um, but that's why I did her in fine tooth combs, right? And I also, again, the fine tooth combs, I sort of think of them as being a little gender that kind of belong to the guys in the boardroom that she was hanging with, because she had power. Um, this piece is about 10 feet tall by about 8 feet wide, just to give you a sense of it. And if it weren't for a computer, again, the precursor to computers being looms, this piece wouldn't exist, because I really needed to be able to pixel light the image to make it work. Now, the thing about C.J. Walker is that um, she's known for this quotation. I'm a black woman from the South. I'm a black woman from the cotton fields of the South. I was promoted to the wash tub. I was promoted to the kitchen. I promoted myself to the business of hair on my own ground. Each one of these combs has one of the words from that quotation um, on it. And every time she says, I was promoted, I was promoted, then that's when the combs turn from being horizontal to being vertical. And that, of course, makes reference back to this kente cloth um, pattern that I share with you here. And I love that she starts that quotation that she was a cotton, from the cotton fields of the South, because in one sense, um, you, that means that she was a textile artist, too, in a way, right? So um, Winslow Homer is from 18... 76, the cotton pickers, and then C.J. Walker in her Model T in 1905. So I made this chair, and this is another one of those times that the audience helped me. I made this chair, and I thought I was making a piece that was solely about the contributions of African Americans that have been hidden in our history and cultures and the way that we don't think about it all the time. Sort of the people in the back 40 acres. So I took a chair, I reupholstered it, and then I stitched it with thread and then cornrowed those threads and made this, these braids on the bottom so that there was this shadow of hair standing in for, um, for the African American presence. And then someone from the audience said to me, but it could also be a throne for C.J. Walker. And yes, it can. And that's the thing about artwork. It gets to live beyond the intention of the maker. In fact, I hope it does. And then I had some, a, a student once asked me, well, what's the difference between a cornrow and a French braid? And it's a matter of scale. That's the only difference. But it made me make a piece about it sort of a Barnett Newman piece, right? <laughs> about thinking about line and line quality kind of differently. And then finally, just a straightforward putting the textile and the text 
and the, and the um, textiles and hairdressing together. There is a hairstyling technique, a cornrowing technique that's called basket weave and it's done just like this. It's cornrows that are actually woven together and it's quite complex and I actually wanted to bring it to you this evening. But my hairdresser did not feel like doing that hairstyle. <laughs> and our time was limited. So finally, to think about the hairdressers and hairdressers' hands and to put my body in the space of that child, that's what the hair craft project did. I was trying to bring together this premise that if hairdressing is in fact the first textile art form, then who better to prove that than hairdressers? So I provided all the hairdressers with these silk-stitched threaded canvases, which took a long time to make, by the way. And I gave them my hair, which didn't take that long to make. I just grow that at night, so it's easy. And then, of course, this is what they produced. And I wanted the hairdressers to be present with their work. One of the things that I love that happened is that lots of people have seen these photographs, and they don't realize that it's my body that's the canvas in each one of these, which means that their artwork has asserted itself past the canvas of my own body. In the same way that I don't want you looking at the canvas that they braided, I want you to be looking at their artwork. So I think it's testimony to the strength of their work. And then, of course, these pieces and the detail. They're incredibly skilled. I am almost a little scared about doing any of this work myself now because they're so good at it. Um, but we're in it together. I learned so much from them, and they learned a little bit from me. And then I want to share with you a little funny mini art prize moment. <clears throat> Before the show, before Michelle took the show here, when the show was up in Richmond, Virginia, I tried to figure out how to bring audiences in Richmond together. So the art audience in Richmond tends to be white, but I belong to that art audience. And Richmond is a very, you know, it's sort of half white and half black. So I belong to the black community there as well, and I belong to the, um, to the art audience there, and I thought, okay, I'm going to engage these women, but how am I actually going to get them to bring their people to the show itself? It'll be like a hair show. There'll be prizes, right? They get that. They absolutely get that, right? Like, okay, I'm going to get a prize for my, um, for my artwork. And I said, so we are going to have some jurors and we're going to have a People's Choice Award. All of this happened before this art prize madness. <laughs> and then the jurors who were um, Lowry Stokes Sims, who is the um, chief curator at the Museum of Arts and Design in New York, and Alilia Bundles, who is a great granddaughter of Madame C.J. Walker. So I had to bring in some heavy hitters, right? And they cared much more about Alilia Bundles than they cared about, you know, my friend Lowry, they, the curator, whatever. But Alilia Bundles, great granddaughter of <laughs> C.J. Walker. So Alilia juried the, um, the hairstyles as depicted in the photographs, and Lowry juried the canvases. And the, and the jurors made their decisions, and the people voted, and they lined up as exactly the same just like Art Prize did with Anila. <laughs> so it's a little fate, I guess, to see that something is happening in our art worlds and communities that sometimes those worlds collide. So my last slide that I want to share with you is what's happening next. Um, Art Prize is going to, um, Art Prize, um, the Haircraft Project is going to be moving to the MFA, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Um, and there, because it's a comprehensive museum, I've asked the curator of African art to select some of um, the, some of the sculptures there that that have beautifully depicted hairstyles. And I'm going to ask one of the hairdressers, as you see here, to redo my hair um, in the version in her interpretation of that hairstyle. So three artists get implied. The original, well, four artists get implied. The hairstylist, 
who did the hairstyle that then is depicted by the sculptor, right? That then is done by the hairdresser on this artist's body. That's all I have for you. <laughs> now, to be fair, you have to have something for me, right? Questions, comments, stuff for me to take home so I can make some more artwork. What? Yes? Well, it's strips of cloth, so when it, it tends to be danced more like this as opposed to like this, so it's not so much long strips of cloth as short strips of cloth. Um, so it functions a little differently, but it is it is the same. The legacy is the same, but the dance has shifted. Yeah. I could do something with that, actually. Okay. Yes, in the back. <laughs> Yes. That's correct. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I mean it is this fascinating thing with the Yoruba because they're, they're not even identical twins normally. Um, and you can imagine that there are lots of people who are trying to figure out what it is in the diet or what it is genetically that is causing this high incidence of twinning. Um, it turns into ritual practices in, among the Yoruba, um, but I really appreciate you noticing that twinning in my work. I'd like to think it's sort of generative. There's something generative about the work, um, hopefully, and, uh, and so it's a nice way to see, think about it being framed that way. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so a lot of decisions that were made there, um, uh, the hairdressers knew that they were getting photographed on that day. So um, some of them dressed up a little bit, and some of them were like, this is, this is how I roll, you know. <laughs> and they knew that they were not going to be in focus, too. And I told them that the reason, that, like, anyone who knew them would be able to recognize them, certainly. But my concern is that their face would be, if they were in focus, that their face would be too strong and compete against their, their artwork. So I wanted sort of a signature having them there. Um, they chose the backgrounds until, so there are a couple of, if someone chose a background color more than once, I mean, if something was chosen twice, I would take it out of commission. Um, and some of them responded to the clothing that I was wearing and the hairstyle that they gave me. There are two in particular that I know that they said, oh, to go with your shirt, I'm going to do this thing. Yeah. And I also should say that for some of them, the best hairstyles that they gave me were not the ones that they did for the photographs. Some of them got nervous. Like, they literally got nervous. These women who were just like, get out of here, whatever, you know, you're done. When, as soon as the cameras came out, they were just, oh, mm, mm. And they're all great hairstyles, but I know that it's not necessarily a representation of everybody's finest work. Yeah. One last question? Oh. Or two, sorry, yeah. <laughs> oh, the black hair flag, it's such a good story. Um, so it belongs to the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts in Richmond, Virginia, and I love that it's there. Um, it was, uh, the, there are flaggers, hmm, there are flaggers outside of the, uh, Richmond is an old city, Everything was Confederate there. The museum is on Confederate ground, so there's a Confederate chapel that shares the grounds with the museum. 
and there was a Confederate flag hanging on the museum grounds. And that was a problem for lots of people, as you can imagine. So the director of the museum and the um, director of the board of the museum, in the time that I've lived in Richmond, just in the past six or seven years now, decided to take down the Confederate flag. And the reaction was that these flaggers are always there saying, we should have our flag here. Why isn't our flag here? And now I get to tell them there is a Confederate flag in the museum that they are welcome to visit anytime. <laughs> there was another question in the back. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, can you speak up just a little bit for me? My Caribbean heritage, oh yeah, I started there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, where I'm from, my Caribbean heritage, my Scottish heritage, my African heritage, all the air heritages that I'm aware of, I like to think that they influence me, but also all of yours do as well, because it's in those conversations that often the dialogue happens and the work gets created. Are you guys hungry? Because I am. And you fed me very well with your thoughts and comments. I appreciate that. But now my belly must be attended to. Thank you. <laughs>